one hour every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. The reimportation of prescription drugs from Canada was the topic of a hearing Thursday on Capitol Hill. A House Government Reform Subcommittee heard testimony from representatives of the pharmaceutical industry, senior citizen advocacy groups, and federal agencies. Indiana Congressman Dan Burton chaired this hearing. It's about two hours. a quorum being present, the Subcommittee on Human Rights and Wellness will come to order, and I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written and opening statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record and without objection so ordered. <coughs> Pardon me. Congressman Gil Gutnecht has been a leader in the House on drug reimportation issues and has agreed to join us today. And I appreciate you being here, Gil, very much. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate having this hearing. Thank you. And uh, I ask unanimous consent that Congressman Gutnick be permitted to serve as a member of the subcommittee today and without objection, so ordered. We will have also Congressman Joseph Crowley, we believe, and uh, Congressman uh, John Duncan, who is from the full committee, here, uh, I guess, sometime before too long. And uh, Congressman Crowley, we'd like to be able to serve as well. Congressman Duncan is a member of the full committee, but not our subcommittee, and we want to allow him the courtesy of being here. Given that this is the first hearing of the subcommittee, all my colleagues aren't here, but I'll mention them. Uh, we're going to have uh, Chris Cannon of Utah, Congressman Chris Shays of Connecticut, and Congresswoman Eliana Ross Layton of Florida on our subcommittee. And on the uh, Democrat side of the aisle, we'll have Diane Watson as the ranking minority member and Congressman Bernie Sanders of Vermont and Congressman Elijah Cummins of Maryland who will also be serving. During my tenure as chairman of the full committee, uh, each of these members was very active and involved in our health oversight hearings and I'm very pleased that they're going to be joining me on this subcommittee. It's often the, uh, the case that Congress acts as a fulcrum seeking to find the appropriate balance between opposing parties on key policy discussions. The subject of today, today's hearing is no different. On one side of the debate is the importance of preserving the free enterprise system. The pharmaceutical industry tells us that it now takes between 500 and 800 million dollars to bring a drug to market. <clears throat> We're also being joined by Mr. Tierney. This estimate is a big, bit, bit misleading though. While the actual costs of research and development on bringing a single drug to market can be high, the actual dollar figure is much less. Only 10 to 30 percent of the products in development actually make it to the marketplace. So companies add the costs of failed products into the R&D of drugs that ultimately are approved. Thus the American consumer, by and large, shoulders the costs associated with drug research and development. On the other hand, Congress must consider the needs of American consumers to have access to safe and affordable prescription drugs. As many as 108 million Americans have one or more chronic health conditions such as diabetes, high blood pressure, asthma, and heart disease, and many require prescription drugs to manage these conditions. 75 percent of Americans aged 50 to 64 are on at least one prescription drug, and 14 percent of women aged 65 are on five prescription drugs in any given week. As we all know, the price of prescription drugs is higher in the United States than in any other country in the world. As one mechanism to address this issue in 2000, the year 2000, Congress overwhelmingly passed and the President signed into law the MEDS Act to allow U.S. consumers, pharmacists, and wholesalers to purchase FDA-approved prescription drugs on the international market. However, the FDA has never implemented this law. Today's hearing is focused, focusing only on consumers' access to prescription drugs purchased from Canadian pharmacies. One of the witnesses we will be hearing from today is Mr. William Hubbard, Senior Associate Commissioner of the FDA. Mr. Hubbard was quoted in the media two weeks ago as saying that anyone facilitating Americans importing prescription drugs from Canada faced potential civil and criminal liability. He went on to say insurance companies and health plans that pay for prescription drugs purchased outside the United States may be violating the law. Now, you know, that sounds pretty strong, but you know, I want to take a couple of words that he, uh, he said, he had. He said they faced potential, potential 
Nevertheless, the civil and criminal liability scared people. And then he went on to say those who aid and abet a criminal violation of the act or conspire to violate the act uh, uh, can be found criminally liable. And he also said that the, those who uh, aid and abet uh, may be violating the law. He said insurance companies and health plans that pay for prescription drugs purchased outside the United States may be violating the law. Well, the law was pretty clear. It was passed by Congress and signed by the President, but the President uh, had some concerns about making sure that the FDA was watching what was coming in. And uh, that's what we want to ask uh, about today, whether or not the FDA is working with the Canadian government to make sure that the uh, drugs coming into this country are safe. It's my understanding that the uh, uh, drug companies in Canada are policed very, very stringently. And so, in some cases, uh, their, their uh, uh, dealing with the pharmaceutical industry up there is even tighter than, with the, than what the FDA here in the United States does. He went on to state that we, the FDA, believe that virtually all drugs imported to the, to, to the United States from Canada by or for individual U.S. consumers violate the U.S. law. And we're going to ask about that today because the law is pretty clear. Uh, what the FDA has, FDA has not done is they have not worked with Canada. And so they're saying that their interpretation is that because the FDA hasn't worked with Canada and checked these uh, drugs out one at a time or checked uh, with the uh, FDA or their counterpart in Canada, that uh, the consumers are violating the law. I, for one, am very puzzled about this. How can the FDA officials feel that Americans are violating U.S. law when three years ago this law was signed by the president. And this bill clarified that it was legal for Americans to purchase prescription drugs internationally. But we're only talking about Canada today, and we're talking about Canada because they're our neighbor and because a lot of seniors, well over a million Americans, and many, most of them are seniors, I believe, are buying their pharmaceuticals from Canada. We're a country with three branches of government, judicial, executive, and legislative. It is not the FDA's job to make law. It is not the FDA's job to make law. It's Congress's job to pass laws and the executive branch to sign them and there to enforce them. And it's their responsibility to implement the laws that Congress passes. And that includes the MEDS Act, which was signed three years ago. So far, the FDA has shirked its responsibility in this area. And this needs to change. The FDA claims they cannot implement this law because they cannot assure the safety of the products being shipped into the U.S. And I understand that uh, uh, the gentleman from the FDA brought a bunch of uh, drugs in from uh, countries around the world where they were counterfeits, but that wasn't, they weren't from Canada. We were talking about Canadian drugs, and it's very well policed up there by their drug agencies. I believe that the FDA needs to do some innovative, out-of-the-pillbox thinking. Health Canada's regulatory model offers safeguards to ensure the safety of products for Canadians. Last week, Mr. Hubbard told me that he was not aware of a single incident that an American had been harmed by a product purchased in Canada. They did mention one in Oregon, one in Oregon. And we have found that aspirins and other uh, drugs sold over the counter in this country cause more problems than one in Oregon caused by a, a Canadian uh, pharmaceutical. Obviously, if the FDA wanted to find a solution to implementing the law, they could. And I'm pleased today that we're uh, going to be hearing from a number of uh, people. Uh, Congressman Roger Zion uh, was going to be with us, but unfortunately I guess he has a health problem and he's not here today. But we'll also hear from Mr. Robert Hayes of the Medicare Rights Center in New York, Dr. Elizabeth Winter from the Coalition for Access to Affordable Prescription Drugs, and Dr. Andy Trosak, the Vice President of Standards for the Canadian International Pharmacists. They'll be giving us information uh, on their, their perspective, and he will be giving information on the, from the Canadian perspective. Earlier this year, GlaxoSmithKline sent letters to Canadian pharmacies threatening to suspend shipments to them if they continued to sell drugs to American consumers. Now, the reason they did that was because they don't make as much money in Canada. They still make a profit, but they don't make as much money in Canada as, uh, as they do here in the United States. In fact, I don't think they make as much money selling drugs any place in the world as they do here in the United States. So what they were doing is they were fighting this on the issue of profit and loss. It's, it's interesting to me that the FDA at almost the same time was saying that they had concerns about drugs coming in from Canada. 
Now you might wonder why the FDA would be bringing the subject at the same time that Smith Klein Glaxo, or Smith Glaxo Klein, was uh, trying to stop selling drugs to pharmaceutical companies in Canada because they don't make as much profit. And uh, GlaxoSmithKline uh, uh, seems to be using strong arm tactics. Now, this is uh, kind of interesting because uh, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, during very tough economic times last year, had a 15 percent growth rate. And I believe Congressman Sanders said they made $10 billion. Was that what you said? They had $10 billion in sales? Just $9 billion, Mr. Just Chairman. $9 billion. And their CEO is making $20 million a year. Now, just last week, a, uh, a member of their firm told me that even with Canada, Canada's price controls, GlaxoSmithKline makes a profit, just not as much as they make in the U.S. So I've co-sponsored legislation with Congressman Sanders and 54 other legislators, and we believe we'll have a lot more, that will institute monetary fines on pharmaceutical companies that reduce access of Americans to lower-cost drugs, VIA, the Internet, from Canadian pharmacies. And I hope the FDA will try to work with the Canadian uh, uh, government to, to, uh, to make sure that uh, they're in concert with us as far as importing uh, drugs to the United States. I invited Dr. J.P. Garnier, the chief executive officer of GlaxoSmithKline, to testify at the hearing day. However, he declined to participate or even to submit testimony. Oh. Had I still be, been chairman, I would have subpoenaed him, but uh, the chair of the committee uh, chose not to subpoena him, so we'll have to make do with, uh, with an empty chair when uh, we start questioning GlaxoSmithKline. His unwillingness to participate at the subcommittee today, I think, speaks volumes. I want to thank you all for coming. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. And I now recognize the minority member, uh, Congressman Diane Watson, since she's not here. I'll go ahead and recognize Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much uh, for holding this important hearing. And the truth is, we owe you a real debt of gratitude because there are not many members of Congress who are prepared to stand up to the most powerful lobby in this country, and that is the pharmaceutical industry. This is a huge issue, and I really do thank you for holding this hearing. The high cost of prescription drugs and what that is doing to the health and well-being of Americans and senior citizens is something that I have been involved with for many, many years. Uh, in 1999, uh, in order to help Vermont uh, citizens, I led the first effort to take constituents over the Canadian border to purchase medicine at a fraction of the price that they were paying in the United States. And I will never forget, as long as I live, the women who were with me who were struggling with breast cancer and who purchased tamoxifen, Mr. Chairman, which is a widely prescribed breast cancer drug, for one-tenth the price, 10 percent, the same exact medicine. And these women, many of whom did not have a lot of money, could not believe that. Several years ago, uh, I uh, introduced reimportation legislation. I know Mr. Goodconnectors and I have worked together on various pieces of legislation in that area, which would have allowed Americans to purchase FDA-approved drugs anywhere in the world. Uh, while a var variation of this legislation was passed in Congress, and as you indicated, is still in existence, we've got to work out some of those loopholes uh, that remain in there. And as you just indicated, you and I and others are working on legislation to stop Glaxo and other companies from limiting their supplies to Canada. We have 54 co-sponsors on that legislation. Let me briefly describe what this problem is, what we're talking about today, and why this hearing is so important. More and more Americans are dependent upon prescription drugs to maintain their health and well-being and to keep themselves alive. At the same time, more and more Americans simply cannot afford the outrageously high prices that the pharmaceutical industry is charging them. While Americans pay by far the highest prices in the world for their medicine, the pharmaceutical industry, which receives huge tax breaks and subsidies from the U.S. government, continues to be the most profitable industry in this country and provides huge compensation packages to their CEOs. In 2001, the industry's profit as a percentage of revenue 
Mr. Chairman, was 18.5%. Not too many businesses that you and I know make 18.5% profit. I will submit information for the record on the compensation issue, but to point out here, for example, that C.A. Heimbold, Jr., former chairman and CEO of Bristol Myers Squibb, in 2001 received total compensation of over $150 million in one year. Elderly people all over this country are suffering and in some cases dying because they cannot afford the high cost of prescription drugs. One executive mm -hmm. receives $150 million in one year from one of the largest drug companies in this country. In addition, in order to protect their profits and make certain that nothing is passed in Congress which protects the American people and lowers the cost of prescription drugs, the industry has spent hundreds of millions of dollars in the last few years on campaign contributions, lobbying, and advertising. If you can believe it, the industry has over 600, 600 paid lobbyists including former top leaders of the Democratic and Republican parties on their payroll in order to stop Congress from doing anything to lower the cost of prescription drugs and protect the American people. Mr. Chairman, in recent years, Americans have begun to express their disgust and anger with the pharmaceutical industry and with the high cost of prescription drugs by utilizing the marketplace, the marketplace when they understand that they can purchase the same exact medicine in Canada for up to 90 percent less than they are paying at home, they are beginning to flock into that market. Estimates are, as you have indicated, that up to one million Americans are either going across the border to buy their medicine or are using the Internet. In recent years, dozens and dozens of new international Internet pharmacies have sprung up in Canada to serve that market. And what has been the response of the pharmaceutical industry to that reality? Have they said, well, maybe we should stop ripping off the American people and lower our prices? The answer is no. Their response, as you have just indicated, is to say, uh-oh, we had better do something about the fact that more and more people are going to Canada, and what we want to do is close that border, close that opportunity for Americans to buy safe and affordable prescription drugs in Canada. And as you indicated, quite appropriately, I don't think it was a coincidence that on one day Glaxo says we're going to limit the supplies to Canada, and then a few days later, guess what happens? The FDA suddenly says, oh, we are really interested in this issue, really concerned about the safety issue. The argument that the drug companies and their allies, including, I'm afraid to say, the FDA are giving, is that they are concerned about the safety issue and their desire to protect the health and well-being of the American people. In my view, this position is absolutely false and without merit. The truth is that all of the medicine being provided to Americans by registered pharmacies in Canada is highly regulated and that the Canadian pharmaceutical drug regulatory system is quite as strong as to what exists here in the United States. Interestingly, and you made this point, Mr. Chairman, despite the fact that some one million Americans who are now buying medicine in Canada, there is not, to the best of my knowledge, one instance in which adulterated or unsafe medicine has been sold to an American. But if the FDA is interested in health and safety, then let me tell you what you may want to take a hard look at. Today in the United States, one out of five Americans are not taking the medicine that their doctors prescribe because they cannot afford that medicine. One out of five. That, Mr. Chairman, is a huge health and safety issue. In fact, I intend to ask the GAO for a study to give us an estimate of how many Americans are dying because they cannot afford the outrageously high cost of prescription drugs that are being charged. I also want to know in that study how many Americans are seeing a deterioration in their health and an increase in suffering because they can't afford the medicine that they desperately need. My guess is that the answer will be thousands of Americans are dying. Tens of thousands of Americans are seeing a deterioration in their health care because they can't afford the high cost of medicine. And meanwhile, the FDA is running to worry about medicine coming in from Canada where zero Americans have been negatively impacted. Now, why is the FDA working with the drug companies to stop Americans from buying medicine in Canada? And let me just speak for myself on this issue. I think the answer is obvious. I think that the 
Drug companies are now asking for payback time. They have contributed huge amounts of money to the political process to protect their profits, and now they're calling in those chits. And I think that this is sad and it's outrageous. And Mr. Chairman, let me conclude by simply saying that if you and I think that the situation is bad today, think about what is happening right now in America, in Vermont, in Massachusetts, in Oregon, all over this country, because of huge deficits that state governments have, they are cutting back on the subsidized prescription drug programs that exist right now. I will introduce into the record a newsletter from a senior citizen center in Medford, Massachusetts. And what the senior citizen center says is, in Massachusetts, the state program is no longer welcoming seniors into the program, and if you want to get reasonably priced prescription drugs, go to Canada. And now what the FDA is saying to those elderly people who are going to be thrown off of their state programs, you got an option. You could die, you get sick, but you can't get safe and affordable drugs from Canada. That is an outrage. Yeah. And I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. Uh, Mr. Duncan? Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be very brief. Uh, let me first say that I appreciate uh, very much you calling this uh, hearing on this uh, issue that is so very, very important to uh, so many Americans at this time and is growing by leaps and bounds in importance uh, every day and every year in this country. Uh, uh, and I want to commend you, Mr. Chairman, because you have a consistent record of uh, calling uh, for hearings and trying to do things about uh, the problems that are of greatest concern, uh, I think, to average Americans uh, throughout the uh, uh, nation. Uh, Mr. Gutnick um, has uh, given me a publication, he gave it to me a few days ago, that said that the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, has estimated that American seniors will spend over $1.8 trillion on prescription drugs over the next uh, 10 years. Uh, and I can tell you that this is a problem that is of concern to more than just uh, seniors. While they buy the highest uh, percentage of the drugs in this country, uh, still the younger and middle-aged people are having to uh, spend many, many billions on prescription drugs. And then also uh, baby boomers uh, see what's happening to their parents who are going through many medical problems and are th thinking about some of these uh, problems and their retirements and so forth themselves. Uh, uh, possibly for the first time. Uh, I have come here today to try to learn a little bit more about this. I'm not the expert on this problem that uh, you are, Mr. Chairman, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Gutnick, who's done such uh, great work, and Mr. Sanders. But uh, I will tell you that I have seen in many different industries that uh, the more highly regulated an industry becomes, uh, the more it ends up being controlled by the big giants because uh, uh, when the uh, rules and regulations and red tape uh, b and, uh, and become so uh, uh, strangling, uh, the small businesses and medium-sized businesses just don't have a chance. And I think that uh, most people at least have the impression in this country that uh, uh, the FDA and the drug uh, industry is controlled uh, by a few big giants, uh, mu very much to the detriment uh, of the consumers in this country. And I can tell you, uh, this is one of the major number, this is one of the very top concerns of, of my constituents in Tennessee. And I don't represent some Appalachian poverty district. I actually represent a district where the economy is pretty good and the uh, average uh, incomes and so forth uh, are, are uh, about uh, the national average or maybe even slightly above. And uh, I can tell you that something is going to have to be done. And so I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and, and Mr. Sanders and Mr. Gutnick to try to see what we can do uh, to do something for the American people in regard to these uh, drug prices that in many cases have become almost outrageous or obscene in some ways. And I, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Duncan. Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the graciousness in allowing me to uh, join you today, even though I'm not on this particular subcommittee. I think you know of my interests as well as the interests of the other members here, all of whom I congratulate, uh, along with yourself, for that prolonged and constant interest that I think is focusing the light on this issue that cannot be shut out. Uh, we have to stay persistent on this, and we keep ha have to move on this. Mr. Sanders's comments we're right on the money you know, from beginning to end. And, and he's been a champion of this, as have you, Mr. Chairman. 
We have amongst the members that are here at this subcommittee meeting today and others in the Congress a number of bills addressing the cost issue uh, on prescription drugs. And whether it's the preserving access to safe, affordable Canadian medicines that was recently filed and many people have uh, signed on to, or whether it's Tom Allen's HR 1400 uh, that talks about uh, having prescription drugs for all seniors at a price that's no higher than the average drug in Canada, France, United Kingdom, Spain, Italy, or Japan. However we try to come at this problem, we seem to be getting more and more people signing on because all of the factors that Mr. Sanders and you addressed in your opening statements are becoming more and more evident. Uh, not too long ago, another subcommittee of this Government Reform Committee, one on which I, I do sit, had hearings in Boston. And uh, Chairman Shays, uh, Mr. Lynch and I and others uh, were at that hearing and had members of the uh, Veterans Administration in to testify about the program that they run, how they purchase prescription drugs for veterans, and the enormous savings that are involved in doing it the way they do it because they are able to buy for such a large market and negotiate with the companies. We do that for veterans. We do that for Native Americans. We do it in Medicaid. And but for the resistance of the prescription drug companies and their champions, we could do it for Medicare. Uh, and that would solve an issue for a lot of seniors who are otherwise shut out of affordable prescription drugs and run into all of the circumstances enumerated in Mr. Sanders's statement. I think the most disturbing part of this is the continual drumbeat that we hear from the industry and from those who are, uh, in my estimation, much too close to the industry, although they're supposed to be regulating them and uh, having oversight over them. And that is that. Uh, this drumbeat for market forces. Now, the fact of the matter is that this is an industry that does not operate under pure market forces. And the public is finally catching on to this, and I think as we move forward, people are going to realize that there has to be a quid pro quo. There are patents that these companies get, and they hold them for a substantial number of years, which essentially gives them a monopoly. That is not a pure market force. That is something that the public at large, through its representatives and government, give to those companies to encourage them to invest in research, to encourage them to develop prescription drugs, and to make in return a reasonable profit for their efforts. In addition to that, by some estimations, they receive almost one half of their research and development monies through the National Institute of Health and other government sources, and yet they want to talk about an open and free market. The fact of the matter is that this Congress is derelict in its duties if we don't start demanding back for those things that the American public has given them, patents, giving them research monies in cooperation every other way, providing through taxpayer monies an FDA program that enhances the value of their products by having a system that establishes what's safe and is taxpayer money, and it is going inuring to the benefit of, that company, of those companies for all of those reasons. We ought to be able to demand that they make a reasonable profit that certainly that we don't impinge on the abilities to have good research and development for more prescription drugs that will be of assistance to people. But we ought to be able to set up a system that protects research and development through some regime and allows a reasonable profit while at the same time insisting that in return for all the benefits this industry is getting, the American people get a fair, affordable price and that they can access these necessary uh, medical uh, prescription drugs. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to end on that note and thank you again and all the other members that are here today for their continued insistence on this. Sooner or later, we will put together a majority. It will be tripartisan in this body, uh, and we will get the American people so riled up that something will have to be done. The FDA, if you really want to put your efforts towards safety, my request of you is don't tell us how you can't bring prescription drugs in over the Internet, and don't tell us how you can't reimport them. Tell us how you are going to take action to protect the efforts of the American people to use the Internet and to reimport at affordable prices until the prescription drug companies are otherwise brought into the fold and made to produce drugs that are accessible and reasonably priced. Thank well, you, well, the gentleman yield to me yield. One thing that I meant to say in my opening remarks was that uh, <clears throat> We're going to pass a prescription drug benefit paid for by the taxpayers of this country before too long. And uh, when we do that, uh, I want to make sure that the taxpayers who's going to be paying for an awful lot of these prescription drugs are getting the best price that they can because it's paid for by all the taxpayers, not just the people getting those prescription drugs. And so I'm very, very concerned that once we pass that prescription drug benefit, the pharmaceutical companies who charge more here in the United States than any place in the world are going to be loading all that profit 
on the back of the taxpayers with the complicity of the Food and Drug Administration. And that really, really bothers me because you got one agency that's paid for by the taxpayers getting money for the, from the taxpayers, and, and then the taxpayers funding not only them, who's supposed to be their, their watchdog, but they're also funding the profits from the pharmaceutical companies. We're reclaiming my time. Those, those are excellent points. But you know, we've had legislation filed here, and a notable thing is how long the industry resisted putting uh, this program into Medicare because they didn't want any constraints on their ability to charge. And we had various pieces that came to the floor of the House, and one provision, in fact, had language that would disallow any effort to control price, and another provision, a separate bill that would insist uh, that, in fact, if it went in Medicare, that Medicare did use some means of trying to bring these prices under. Either these insurance companies, if left totally without any regulation at all, are going to bankrupt individual seniors one by one by one, or if they get into some system where the government assists in the purchase of prescription drugs for seniors or others, and there are no controls on the price and the profits that they can get while they're getting all these other benefits from the taxpayers' money, they will bankrupt this government in one large chunk. So we have an obligation here uh, specifically and particularly while we're producing such benefit to them through public taxpayer dollars to make sure that that regulation here. This is one instance where I think my friends on both sides of the aisle here understand that some regulation is necessary and Congress ought to get about the business of deciding what's appropriate. Yield back. Mr. Gutnick, you've been a champion of this for a long time and, and so we're, we're joining your cavalry. Cal cavalry. cavalry. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, I just would like to also thank you on behalf of Mr. Sanders, especially myself, who have uh, essentially been laboring in this uh, vineyard for a very long time. Uh, it has been very difficult to get some of the committee chairmen to take this issue seriously, and it is a very serious issue. It is huge. Uh, when you look at the numbers, as uh, the gentleman from Tennessee mentioned, our own Congressional Budget Office estimates that seniors alone will spend $1.8 trillion on prescription drugs over the next 10 years. And I've got a chart, and if we could have that put up, and I'll just point out, and these are not my numbers. Uh, there are a number of independent groups. Uh, this is from the Life Extension Foundation. Uh, you all have a little copy of this chart in the little handout I put out. And I'll just point out a couple of things. The differences between what American consumers pay and what consumers in the industrialized world pay for the same drugs. Just look at the first four. Augmentin, a very commonly prescribed drug. The United States average price for a 30-day supply is $55. Uh, in Canada, that, that is $12. And in Europe, the average price is $8.75. Cipro, a drug that we learned a lot about uh, when we had uh, anthrax here in these buildings. Uh, the average price in the United States, almost $88. The average price in Canada, $53. Uh, and in Europe, that same drug sells for $40. And incidentally, let me mention, Mr. Chairman and members, that um, these drugs are essentially made in the same plants under the same FDA approval. So we're not talking about something different in Europe uh, and Canada. These are the same drugs under the same FDA approval. Glucophage, uh, a very important drug for diabetes. Um, in the United States, uh, according to the Life Extension Foundation and their research, about $124 for a 30-day supply. That same drug in Canada is $26. And in, in Europe, the average price is $22. We're talking about enormous differences. And uh, Mr. Sanders and I may not agree on everything, but we agree that there is something wrong with a system that allows those huge disparities. And in his discussion, Mr. Sanders mentioned the drug tamoxifen, a very important anti-cancer drug. Most of the basic research, most of the cost was done by the NIH. Uh, the bulk of the cost that were ultimately shouldered by the pharmaceutical company that, that uh, patented it were for attorneys and for marketing, not for research and development. And that's a very important drug for women here in the United States, and it's an example where we pay uh, disproportionately more for the same drug, even though the drug was developed principally at taxpayer expense. The arguments we're going to hear and we have heard consi consistently are about safety. But these are just specious arguments. Once you get below the surface and scrape off that thin veneer, you find out that it is, in fact, first and foremost, the Food and Drug Administration. And every day, this country imports millions of pounds of food. Let me give you some examples. Uh, last year, the estimate is we estimated, uh, we're, we're told that we brought in 331 million pounds of apples. We brought in 
uh, 19 million pounds of blueberries into the United States. We brought in 1.2 billion pounds of asparagus. We brought 64 million pounds of strawberries into this country. We, we imported over a billion pounds of cantaloupes. And the reason I mention that is according to the FDA's own studies, and the FDA ultimately is responsible for the health and safety uh, of those products coming into the United States by their own estimates of these fruits and vegetables coming into the United States, their own tests, 2% of these products are contaminated with foodborne pathogens, including, including things like salmonella. Now, salmonella can kill you, and yet what is the FDA's response to foods coming into the United States? Almost nothing. And Mr. Sanders is absolutely correct. The FDA keeps very good records, and as far as we can tell, there has not been a single death related to importing of legal prescription drugs into the United States. As a matter of fact, the only real example that we can find where you have adulterated drugs uh, was done by a pharmacist in Kansas City, Missouri, not in Alberta, Canada, not in Mexico, not in Europe. It happened in Kansas City, Missouri. And that uh, pharmacist is currently serving a 30-year sentence in a federal penitentiary. So the idea of safety, it seems to me, is grossly overstated. And I want to make this point, and it's made by Steve Schondelmeyer, who really is the top expert in the United States on, on pharmacies and, and pharmaceutical costs. He is a professor at the University of Minnesota, and this is a quote I hope you'll remember, that a drug that you cannot afford is neither safe nor effective. And we're forcing too many seniors, too many Americans to make a choice they should not have to make because they cannot afford the drugs that are available. Finally, let me just say, and I, I've already spoken longer than I should, but again, Mr. Sanders is correct. This is not an issue between Republicans and Democrats. This is not even an issue between right and left. This is an issue of right versus wrong. It is wrong to force American consumers to pay the world's highest prices because, after all, we are the world's best consumers. The real answer, it seems to me, is to open up markets, to defang the FDA, to allow American consumers to have access to world-class drugs at world market prices. We should not permit our own FDA to stand between American consumers and lower drug prices. It is not, not really a matter of shame on the pharmaceutical industry, but for members of Congress, it's a matter of shame on us. We have allowed this system to exist. It is time for us to do something about it. And when we do, we can save American consumers upwards of $600 billion over the next 10 years. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing. This is an important beginning. I think it's going to yield important results for American consumers. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your work, uh, Mr. Goodnick. You've done a great job in the past, and I know you'll continue. <coughs> Mr. Cannon. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing. It's uh, a, a very important hearing. I apologize that I can't be here longer, but I did want to ask unanimous consent to submit a, an opening statement for the record and some questions for the record. Sure, no problem. Thank you very much, and I'll stay here with, as long without, as I can. Without objection. Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you as well for holding this hearing. I'm sorry I didn't get here to hear the comments of my other colleagues, but I want to say to Mr. Gutnick, I, I, he's a real hero to me on this issue. And I realize there are other, you know, there are, are reasons why it, it exists, but we need to find a solution. Uh, and I hope he pursues this. I believe that we should be having a debate on this issue on the floor of the House. I think it is uh, disgraceful, frankly, that we haven't had the kinds of hearings we should on this legislation uh, and that we haven't been debating it uh, in a very meaningful way. And let, let us learn from that debate. But in the bottom line, for me, prices are too expensive in the United States, too cheap elsewhere. I, I think that because of price controls, I think prices probably need to come up a little bit overseas. They need to come down over here. And I think this legislation is a way to help force that issue. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shays. Uh, Ms. Watson. Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank you very much. And uh, as we begin this inaugural hearing, <coughs> of this newly created subcommittee on human rights and wellness, uh, let me first say that I look forward to working with you and all the other members of this subcommittee to conduct meaningful oversight of government operations in the area of health and human rights within our jurisdiction. As the ranking minority member, let me also commend you for choosing an important issue to start with. We appreciate it. 
The problem of discrimination in the pricing of U.S. pharmaceuticals is well documented, and it is of enormous consequences to millions of Americans who need affordable access to prescriptive drugs. Americans pay substantially more for prescriptive drugs than purchasers in other countries, and the problem is particularly acute for our nation's uninsured seniors. Because Congress has failed to establish a Medicare prescriptive drug benefit, seniors who do not have private prescription drug coverage must pay for prescription drugs out of their pockets. Research by the minority staff of the Government Reform Committee has shown that seniors in congressional districts across the country pay twice as much for prescriptive drugs as their counterparts in other countries. For some drugs, they pay as much as 10 times as their foreign counterparts. For these American seniors and the rest of America's 40 million uninsured, this can mean having to choose between going without food on the one hand or going without the medication on the other. Lower drug prices abroad have led millions of Americans to purchase drugs from foreign sources. Internet pharmacies, the subject of a recent full committee hearing, facilitate these transactions, and their recent proliferation has raised serious concerns about whether American consumers can receive appropriate medical supervision. Mr. Chairman, despite the incessant pharmaceutical industry complaints to the contrary, research by the committee's minority staff demonstrates that international pricing disparities are not explained either by the duration and the cost of the FDA approval process or by the disproportionate U.S. research and development cost. It is within our power to correct this problem if we have the will to do so. So today we have an opportunity to hear the perspectives of the FDA Glasgow Smith Klein and representatives of interested professional and consumer organizations, including former Representative Robert Z uh, Roger Zion, chairman of the 60 Plus Association. I want to thank all of our witnesses for appearing before us today, and I look forward to hearing their views on pending legislative proposals and any other measures they might suggest to bring uh, before us. Uh, thank you so much for allowing us this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Watson. I'll look forward to working with you as well as Mr. Sanders and Mr. Tierney and Mr. Shays and the judge and, of course, Mr. Gutnick. Uh, Mr. Hubbard, uh, would you and uh, Mr. Taylor please uh, approach the table and stand to be sworn? Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth shall be God? Seated. You have an opening statement, Mr. Hubbard? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have written testimony, but I'll make a few opening remarks, if I may. Okay. And as, I, as, uh, as you noted, I'm accompanied today by uh, Mr. John Taylor, the chief of our enforcement group at FDA. Um, as you know, the emergence of the Internet has given consumers a new tool to carry out commerce in a number of ways. One, one of those uses, the purchase of prescription drugs, offers convenience, but also particular risk to unknowing consumers. Seniors in particular are using the Internet to purchase their medications from sites offering lower prices and are even traveling to other countries for that purpose as well. There is no doubt that some drugs can be obtained more cheaply from foreign Internet sites and from foreign pharmacies. However, I should note that generic drugs are less expensive in the United States than in many other countries, indeed 7 percent less expensive in the United States than in Canada. And, and our new commissioner, Mark McClellan, has made getting generic drugs on the market for seniors and others a high priority. In fact, he, he tells us frequently it, we need to get cheaper drugs to patients, but we need to do it safely. We certainly under, understand consumer concerns about the high cost of drugs. We all know that. But please understand that FDA's principal job is to assure the safety of the drugs. We are not a, a price agency. Um, and we are very concerned about the trend toward foreign purchase of drugs. 
And we'd like to give you a few examples today of why we're concerned. Here on the uh, dais, and I believe you have hard copy, uh, are some posters of some websites. This first one uh, looks like a, uh, a very legitimate site with a picture of a physician and a pharmacist there, and it looks very American, it looks very legitimate. It says, your source for high quality FDA approved medication. So our investigators have traced this site to its source. It's in Thailand. The second one, if Sarah could flip for us. It's again a, a, a site offering the drug Accutane. And Accutane is a drug that has very serious restrictions in this country because of its potential to cause severe birth defects. It is marketed under what we call a risk management program in which very careful warnings are given for, for it not to be taken by women of childbearing age or women who are pregnant. This drug, this site also talks about FDA approved products and mentions that the products are made in Nutley, New Jersey. This site is in Thailand as well and the drugs that we have purchased from this site come with no warnings to pregnant women. The third site I will mention sells Viagra and it interestingly even gives its address. It, it is at, um, uh, at 164th Street in Miami Beach, Florida. But in fact, our investigators have found this site is in Israel. We have other sites that we have given you in hard copy uh, that are all sell drugs from Canada. And these sites, uh, when, when our investigators pursued where they were, they found they were registered in the Barbados. Now, they also say they are in Canada. But the point is we don't know where they are and we have no way to reach to them to learn where they are. And if we don't know where they are, we don't know where they get their drugs. And let me show you, uh, Mr. Chairman, just a few of the drugs that people buy from these sites. This is one we took out of the mail yesterday at Dulles Airport. That's what the patient gets, a bag of pills. No, no, it doesn't even give a name of the drug, no warnings. Where'd that come from? Um, it came from the International Mail Facility at Dulles Airport. It was purchased, we believe, over the internet and mailed to a, uh, an individual whose name I will not mention in Ashburn, Virginia. But where'd it come from? This drug, uh, the return address, it does not show, I'm afraid. Although I have others that, that do show. Uh, and I won't bring all of these out, but let me give you just one example. The return address on this one is Bangkok, Thailand, addressed to a person in Durham, North Carolina. Apparently, the, uh, this was addressed to a, a person with a female name, and apparently she has bought some estrogen, some female drug. But she's also purchased a drug called finasteride. This drug is only for men. It is so toxic that if a pregnant woman even <laughs> handles the pill from this box, she could cause severe birth defects in her child. And this seal's been broken. This stuff's crumbling out of here. So these are the sorts of things that people really get, Mr. Chairman, when they, when they go on these internet sites. None of the drugs that we got from the airport yesterday appear to have been made in the United States. They all have no labeling or foreign labeling and appear to be from sources other than the United States or North America. Now, we are told that some of the drugs that come from Canada are, in fact, perfectly safe, and that may be true, but we don't have any way to know. One of the best things that Congress ever did, we believe, was create the drug approval process that set up a process for drugs to be approved as safe and effective by the FDA and manufactured under very stringent manufacturing controls with very stringent marketing controls and regulation by the states of physicians and pharmacies. Patients in this country have total confidence they're getting a safe drug. People that buy these sorts of drugs cannot tell the difference. And I'll make one last point. In, in foreign countries, in some foreign countries, half of drugs are counterfeit. The, these are two identical drugs. One's real and one's counterfeit. I can't tell the difference. Our scientists can't tell the difference. And so if, if you open up the world to these sorts of drugs, the bad guys are going to have a way to get in. Right now, it's very hard to market that product in the United States. It's very hard to get into the system but these internet sites give patients and nefarious sellers of drugs access to that system. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll uh, take your question, and so will Mr. Taylor, and thank, thank you. Thank you. I want to give you some figures that we found very interesting. In 1990, the pharmaceutical industry gave $2.3 million in campaign contributions. In 1992, it was $5 million. 
1994 it was 5.2 million. 1996 it was 9.3 million. 1998 it was 9 million. And then in 2000, because there was questions about a lot of things dealing with the <coughs> pharmaceutical industry, it went from 9, 000, 9 million to almost 20 million the last two election cycles. There are 600, over 600 lobbyists up here lobbying the Congress, the administration uh, about pharmaceuticals. And there are many of us in the Congress that believe they do have undue influence. And there's also kind of a revolving door policy where an awful lot of the people who work at the FDA and our health agencies leave uh, these agencies and go to work directly to w uh, with the pharmaceutical industries. And uh, I'll be glad to give you some cases in point if you'd like to have those, but I think you probably are aware of that. Now let me ask you a few questions. <clears throat> Your testimony states that the FDA cannot assure U.S. citizens that prescription drugs they're buying over the Internet from foreign countries, such as Canada, and that's what we're talking about today, are safe. On September the 5th, 2001, you testified before the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation that you've not looked at the chain of supply system in Canada. Have you looked at the chain, uh, Canada, Canadian chain of supply system since you testified in 2001? We've certainly had discussions with our Canadian colleagues. However, FDA has no authority to go to Canada and assess their system. So you haven't looked at it? Other than having the Canadian counterpart to the FDA explain their system to us, no, Mr. Chairman, you have not. Can you make the assertion today that the Canadian chain of supply system is unsafe for Americans? I would not want to characterize another country's uh, drug safety system, Mr. Chairman. Well, I know, but you brought all these packages in here, all mostly from Thailand and every place else, but you didn't say anything about Canada. Well, I, I, we will, was, we, we'll be glad to characterize the safety of drugs, but, but not of another country's drug approval system. How, how many cases uh, do you know of where Canadian pharmaceuticals came in this country caused damage to people? We think that's unknowable. Um, how, how would you know if, if hundreds of thousands of patients are taking a Canadian or any other foreign blood pressure medicine and their blood pressures were being reduced by 10 points instead of 40? How many people, you might not know that for 10 years. How many people were damaged last year by aspirin, do you know? I, I don't know, Mr. Chairman. Well, that's sold in the United aspirin States. Aspirin certainly that's has side effects, yes. And you don't know that either? I don't know that specific How number. about Tylenol? Again, uh, all of the non-steroidal non anti-inflammatory drugs have side effects. But you don't know how many here in the United States, and you don't know how many from Canada were caused. I'm sure our physicians at FDA would know more about the uh, domestic uh, drug side effects. Mr. Hubbard, at this same Senate hearing, uh, a letter from the former FDA commissioner, uh, David Kessler, was read, and it stated the Senate bill, the MEDS Act, which was signed into law, allows only the importation of FDA-approved drugs manufactured in FDA-approved facilities and for which the chain of custody has been ma maintained uh, addresses my fundamental concerns. I believe the importation of these products can be done without causing a greater health risk to the American consumer. I do He's, not believe we agree with that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, he was the head of the FDA, wasn't he? He certainly was. Are you the head of the FDA? No, I'm not, Mr. Chairman. Does the, does the head of the FDA now take issue with this? I, I, I believe Dr. McClellan would say that it's important that consumers in this country get cheaper drugs, but safely. And that, and that bringing in drugs from foreign countries would not be the way to do that. Mr. Kessler, I think, was talking about uh, Canada in particular, wasn't he? And he said the chain of custody, because that's what they call it up there, uh, for which the chain of custody has been maintained addresses my fundamental concerns. It addressed his concerns because he, he said, in effect, that the Canadian system did a pretty good job. And he says, it addresses my fundamental concerns. I believe the importation of these products can be done without causing a greater health risk to the American consumer. You don't agree with that? I believe he was referring to legislation that you referred to earlier, Mr. Chairman, that passed the Congress and was not effectuated either by the Clinton or the Bush administrations. No, but the point is, he was saying he had no concerns about that, didn't he? I think he was saying that that legislation would alleviate concerns he had because it would set up a, a verified chain of custody of the drugs to confirm that they had gone to Canada, Canada from the United States and had returned to the United States uh -huh. with, uh, with a chain of custody maintained. Right. Well, I think that's pretty clear. He didn't have a great deal of concern. Do you believe that Canada regulates the quality of medic medications manufactured and sold there as rigorous, rigorously as the FDA? 
again, I, that's asking me to judge so or characterize the Canadian system. Well, let system me ask you a question. <laughs> if you don't know, why don't you find out? You've got people here who are paying two and three and four times as much for drugs, and you sit back and say, you might be criminally uh, guilty if you abet somebody buying these drugs. And these people, as Mr. Sanders said, many of them can't afford uh, to buy their drugs and food. And I know some of these people. And you're sitting there on your ivory tower, and you're saying, well, I don't know about Canada. I don't know if their system's as good as ours. You had a cursory conversation with them. But you, uh, you really don't know. And, and, and yet you're making these decisions saying, hey, if you buy drugs from Canada, you may be guilty of breaking the law, thereby, thereby implying that these people might be prosecuted. Now, these senior citizens, many of them aren't as uh, sophisticated as you and I. They know that you're probably not going to do that, but you scare the hell out of them. Now, you know, the last thing I'd like to say to you is that this is not going to be the end of it. Today, in the AARP publication going to 35 million people, 35 million people, they are talking about this issue. We're going to contact every single senior citizens group in this country and keep pounding on them. Now, I know that the pharmaceutical industry gives 20 million bucks a year in political contributions up here on the Hill and to the administration and to others. And they do that both under Democrat and Republican administrations. And I also believe the FDA is influenced by the pharmaceutical industry. And anybody that doesn't believe that's got their eyes shut. And so the last thing I'd like to say is this ain't going to go away. I'm going to be chairman of this committee hopefully for six years, and you're going to be here a lot. And uh, we're not going to quit until you guys do something about this. And Mr. Gutnick is going to get exactly what he wants. He's going to get all the hearings he can handle. Uh, let's see, uh, who's next? Ms. Watson. I think that uh, the chair is correct in, because uh, he feels the emotion of this issue. Uh, I would hope that uh, the FDA would uh, take a look at the pharmaceuticals that are being ordered through the Internet from Canada. I was told that there have been uh, no uh, negative uh, effects. But I do know in other countries that the ingredients uh, are different when they make up a compound. And I would like uh, some research on how those ingredients would impact. You held up a package of a particular product that was made for the male system, not the female system. And I'm sure there are other kinds of pharmaceuticals that are in the hands of Americans today. They simply don't have the knowledge. So I would hope that uh, FDA, through one of its auxiliary branches, could do a little research on those particular pharmaceuticals and also on the Canadian products. Uh, am I correct to say that I have not heard of uh, any negative effects of the products that come in from Canada? But there could be That's more. That's generally correct, uh, Ms. Watson. But mm -hmm. again, the, the system is a passive one. It's not set up to record these sorts of things. These drugs are in violation of, of the law and, and should not be coming in at all. And so the system is not set up to, to, to um, uh, record potential adverse events from drugs that shouldn't be here at all. Well, let me suggest to the chair that maybe we would want to promulgate some legislation that would give the authority to the FDA and any other branch under maybe HHS to look into this matter. And uh, I think it's a matter of directing and funding, but I think we might want to look into that. Exp Would the gentlelady yield? Yes, please. Uh, do you have this authority already? I think we would have the authority to test drugs coming in from Canada, yes. Yeah. Well, then why aren't we doing it if you have concern? Uh, other members have asked us that. The, uh, it would be a very expensive proposition, and um, there's, uh, there are concerns about what you'd be looking for. There are also concerns about that it would be only a snapshot of that batch of drugs that you test at any given time. So there are a number of logistical uh, uh, questions about that, but we'd be glad to respond to that in more detail um, in writing, uh, Ms. Watson. Uh, let, let us do this as a committee, and I will uh, work with the chair on this. Send a formal letter from the subcommittee to the FDA asking them to use their authority to take a look and do an evaluation of the drugs. It's an illegal uh, procedure now, and uh, we would just like you to evaluate what's going on 
you know, uh, what you think the traffic is like and, um, and the volume and uh, how many people are in violation. But I would like to know uh, what the impact and effect these pharmaceuticals have on those who are ordering them. And I think under that authority, if it uh, requires additional funding, you need to work through the system for that. But since you have that authority, I'd like you to take the responsibility. Maybe we can draft a letter to ask him to do that. I'll be help happy to do that with you, uh, Ms. Watson. Mr. Mr. Kutnick? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to come back to a couple of things that, uh, that you said, Mr. Hubbard. First of all, you said that your uh, scientists could not tell whether that drug was, in fact, the real drug or a counterfeit. But it is, isn't it really true that you could do the same thing with a drug that I would purchase down the block at the local pharmacy? Could your scientists tell uh, by just examining the bottle whether, in fact, it was real or counterfeit? No. The difference, though, is that the system and, and, and is so closed a, in this country drug. that you wouldn't, ha you wouldn't ever ne even be looking for counterfeits in this country generally. They're very, very rare in the United States. Very oh, rare. Oh, it's very rare Where, in the United States. Whereas counterfeits in foreign countries are very common. Because we don't test, we know that it's very rare here in the United States. Well, Mr. Mr. Hubbard, I think you really should look at the facts. Counterfeiting is happening in the United States right now. And do you know why? It's because the prices are so high. I want to come back to something that you said uh, uh, about a year ago in testimony before a hearing here on the Hill on September 5th, 2001. Uh, you said, and I'll just quote you, you said, the Canadian system is one that I have some knowledge of and I would have some degree of confidence to say as opposed to the third world. In other words, the Canadian system is a pretty good system. We don't have Canadians dropping like cordwood from buying prescription drugs at their pharmacies, do we? I mean, are there, are there, is there evidence? That's right. I say that if I were in Canada and were Ill, Ill and saw a Canadian physician and was given a drug from a Canadian pharmacy, I would have a relatively high degree of confidence that I was getting a safe and effective drug. Let me ask another question about the FDA. You are responsible for fruits and vegetables coming into the United States, are you not? Yes. What I'm, do you perhaps say? Mr. Taylor should answer this next question. Well, what, what does the FDA say to the roughly 1,012 people who have gotten sick in the recent years as a result of eating imported raspberries? Do we have a responsibility to those people? Um, absolutely. And what about the 270 people who have uh, gotten sick from eating imported strawberries? Absolutely. What about the 25,000 people who have gotten sick as a result of eating imported cantaloupes? Absolutely. Now, what do we do? We know anything about where those cantaloupes come from? Actually, I mean, could some of them actually be coming from foreign countries uh, in the Pacific? Actually, we do know a great deal about the cantaloupe situation. And, and to answer your question more generally, um, in the last two years, there's been an increase in our funding to deal with imported foods as part of the counterterrorism efforts. So we have increased our coverage not only at the border, we've also inc increased the number of foreign So you stop and check every shipment that comes into the United no, States I, now? No, I, we do not. How, no, many do you, how many do you stop? Um, I, think, I think the figures are that we, I think one point, only 1.7% 1 of the food. 1.7%. Now, it seems to me, and, and, and I'm just, I've been watching this now for four years. You have set a bar in terms of imported drugs that is as high as it possibly can. Even though, even your scientists can't even prove drugs at the local pharmacy, whether or not they are in fact the real drug or a counterfeit, by your own admission. But you have a bar for imported drugs that is as high as the ceiling, and yet for imported foods, it's almost zero. And we know the evidence, the empirical evidence is overwhelming. You are much more likely to get sick from an imported strawberry than you are an imported legal FDA approved drug. Now, let me bring one more point. My time is almost up. Even in your own handout, Mr. Chairman, you need to see this, and this is important for, for members to understand. Even in your own handout, you show something that the FDA does not require in the United States of America. And that is counterfeit proof FD, or I'm sorry, counterfeit proof uh, blister pack packaging. Most countries in Europe now require that kind of packaging. And the company that makes that packaging is the same company that provides the materials to our U.S. printing office that prints the $1 bills and the $5 bills and the $20 bills. The question I would have for the FDA, why don't you require that kind of counterfeit proof packaging here in the United States? Quite actually, we are looking into um, developing technologies that will help both industry and the FDA improve our ability to detect counterfeits. Um, 
as you noted, the U.S. Printing Office has done a great deal of work on this, but there are also academic centers and, and others in industry are trying to look at state-of-the-art ways that can prove our ability to detect counterfeits. But you would have to acknowledge that it's much more difficult to put a counterfeit drug in a counterfeit-proof package, which you actually show on one of the websites that you introduced as evidence that this may not be, in fact, the same drug, right? I, I will admit that it is more difficult, but I will also say that, quite frankly, um, some of the counterfeiting these days is so high-tech that even though it makes it harder, it does not necessarily preclude the possibility that it will occur. But we are testing some of the drugs here in the United States and finding out that some of them may be counterfeit. Isn't oh, that correct? Abso absolutely. I mean, the, the suggestion, we should not suggest that there have not been instances in, in the domestic market where there have not been not been situations where we've discovered that products have been counterfeited. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's absolutely right. I would yield. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just want to point out that uh, we have a, a witness here today, and I don't know if you're going to stay for the witness. I hope you will. Uh, Ms. Elizabeth Winner, uh, she came up with a, 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 an organization called Internet Mail Order Pharmacy Accreditation Commission, IMPAC. And they are developing a rigorous system of quality standards for American, Canadian, and Mexican mail-order pharmacies. And they use this method of packaging so that you can't get in there and change it. You can't, if, if, it's, a, if it's a prescribed drug and it's put in this, this container and it's sealed, it comes in, it, it can't be counterfeit. It, it's got to be a, 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 the, the product that they purchased. Now, what I don't understand, if she does this as an individual citizen why in the heck hasn't the fda looked into it with canada because if they did that they could work with these pharmacists up there they could work with the canadian pharmaceutical uh, uh department the government department and they could make sure that there was some kind of a system where you would seal these things so that they came in without a, a great deal of risk and the only reason i can think of that you're not doing that is because the profit is so much greater here in the United States for the pharmaceutical companies. And I hate to think that. That's why I would, I would hope, and I, I'm sure that my colleagues would hope, that you would look at these kinds of, of alternatives so that people can buy things safely on the Internet, especially from Canada. Uh, let's see, Mr. Sanders, I think you're next. And thank you for yielding to me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Hubbard, you're under oath now, uh, so I'd like you to answer this question for me. Uh, for the past 15 or 16 years, the FDA has used its enforcement discretion to allow Americans to get 90 days of a prescription drug in Canada, and I know that because I went across the border uh, with people from Vermont and other members of Congress have done the same. Now, Mr. Burton alluded to this, it appears that the FDA is clamping down on this practice. Glaxo is withholding some of its medicine to Canada, and I find it's somewhat coincidental that all of this is happening at the same time as Mr. Burton indicated, huge sums of money are coming from the pharmaceutical industry into the United States Congress and, in fact, the White House. Now, you're under oath. Could you please tell this committee who within FDA or the Department of Health and Human Services or elsewhere in the administration has advocated for or directed a retreat from the FDA's longstanding enforcement policy on this issue. Who gave you this idea suddenly after 16 years where, to the best of our knowledge, there has not been one problem, suddenly, coincidentally, when the drug companies are beginning to lose money, the FDA is off and running? Who have you been talking to? I'll, I'll just simply say that in September I'll have 32 years in the government as a civil servant working for both Republicans and Democrats, and at no time have I uh, attempted to make any uh, decision or recommendation based on any sort of political influence. The, the, the policy you're referring to is what is called the personal importation policy. It was created in the late 1980s to let patients with serious or life-threatening diseases such as cancer or AIDS patients go to a foreign country to access an unapproved drug, an experimental drug, and it allowed that patient to come bring 90 days supply in under supervision of, of a physician if there was no alternative treatment in the United States. It, th that policy has no relationship to people purchasing these... But these, in, fact, um, in fact, because I did it, many of my colleagues have done it, and hundreds of thousands of Americans have done it, the reality is that for many, many years now, Americans have been driving over the border or increasingly using the Internet without a problem. So my question is, 
If you have a program that is saving Americans huge sums of money, saving lives, why suddenly, all of a sudden, Mr. Goodconnect mentioned problems with fruits and vegetables. There are millions of people in this country probably getting sick because they can't afford prescription drugs. How did it occur to the FDA that one of their major priorities is to produce literature like this, frightening the American people, investigating folks who are trying to keep themselves alive? Where did this idea come from? Yeah, sure. Mr. Taylor will uh, we'll answer this. Um, I, I noticed that you were, that you were waving the pamphlet there. Um, I haven't been here the, at, at FDA the, the whole period of time that the um, personal importation policy has been in place, but I have not seen, even in the last few years, a, a change in the policy itself. Um, we obviously um, have not focused on the individuals who are purchasing the product. The focus for us has been on the products itself. What we are trying to do, recognizing that people indeed are going to go across the border to purchase these products and, quite frankly, are going to purchase the products over the Internet, as we've discussed today. What we've tried to do and what we've tried to emphasize is the fact that we, the FDA, who, quite frankly, are, are given the mandate of trying to assure that people are receiving products that are safe and effective, cannot necessarily do so for these products. And what we're trying to do is educate people and, and help people make informed decisions because we have seen an increase in an increase in the mischaracterization of certain products. For example, we've seen an increase in websites that have that have characterized products as FDA approved. No, I have a limited amount of time, so I, okay. I apologize. Okay, I, fair you know, enough. So it's not not the best form, format to do okay, these things. But let enough. me ask you this. Sure. This is my concern. Okay. You want to educate Americans. You know what I think you should be educating Americans about? You should be putting out pamphlets that say for the last 16 years, people have been going across the Canadian border, saving substantial sums of money, probably many instances staying alive rather than dying, improving their physical condition rather than seeing a deterioration, and there hasn't been one problem. How about putting out some leaflets on that? The issue is you, you bring up these charts about Thailand. We are not talking about Thailand. We are talking about Canada. And the evidence, again, and please contradict me if I am wrong, you have not indicated to us one instance of an American purchasing a prescription drug from Canada who has been hurt. And the answer is that Canadian pharmacies, as, Mr. as the chairman has indicated, are regulated to quite the level that our uh, pharmacies are regulated, that in fact, all drugs sold through registered pharmacies that come into the United States are exactly the same products as are sold to Canadians. And that, in fact, because the pharmaceutical industry continues to charge Americans so much money, out of desperation, people are now going across the border. Frankly, I think that pieces of literature like this are outrageous. I would agree with the chairman that I see it is really a strange coincidence that with all of the money coming in from the industry, with Glaxo beginning to put pressure on the Canadians, that suddenly the FDA is paying at attention to a non-problem rather than paying attention to a more serious problem. Mr. Hubbard, Mr. Taylor, Taylor, have you done any research into how many people in this country die or see a deterioration in their physical condition because they cannot afford the medicine their doctors prescribe? Do you have any studies on that? That's not uh, the type of study that FDA really? would do. Really? You're supposed to protect the safety and health of the American people. Millions of people can't afford their medicine. They're suffering. Maybe instead of scaring the American people about not going to Canada, you might want to do a study like that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. Mr. Cummins? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I just want to say to you, gentlemen, I, 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 I want to... Uh, associate myself with the words of Mr. Sanders. Um, it is so sad, incredibly sad, that um, I have people in my district, and I see it, I hate to even go into a senior housing uh, uh, facility, because over and over again, I see people uh, as late as about a month ago, well, actually, let's go back a year, where a gentleman said, uh, Congressman, you know, don't uh, don't worry about passing some type of prescription drug legislation for me. He said, I've been cutting up pills now for the last three or four years, and I'll be dead. Do it for my fellow 
uh, tenants here in this housing project. Going back to Mr. Sanders' comments, um, I, have, I have constituents that go to Canada too. They take busloads up there trying not to just get rid of pain. In many instances, trying just to stay alive. Stay alive. And I would appreciate it very much. And I wish that they could, I, you know, I, I started to say I wish they were here today. But I'll be honest with you, I think if they were here today, they probably would be jumping over that table and be very upset. Probably lifting up canes because they get that upset because they know their lives are on, on the line. And they know that they're choosing between eating and, and buying prescription drugs. And the chairman is absolutely right. So often I think that we get, we find ourselves divorced from the very people who we're supposed to be trying to help and trying to protect. And I would appreciate it if you would put just as much effort into trying to lift people up so that they can stay alive, stay alive, uh, as you do in putting these little pamphlets together. Because I think that, sadly, um, the American people is get, are getting sick and tired of not being able to afford the drugs that they need. And it is so very, very painful. It's probably the most painful thing I do as a congressman <laughs> is to hear the stories. And so um, I beg you that if you can't find a way to do the kind of things that uh, Mr. Sanders said, you ought to get out of the job and let somebody else do it. Let somebody else do it who will have the compassion for people and will help them stay alive. I think it's almost criminal. It's almost criminal when we come to a point where uh, our seniors are being denied the kind of information that they need. Because, uh, I mean, this is what it's all about. I've, been in, I've told my, my, my constituents, you know, uh, until we can get some kind of prescription drug bill for them to do whatever you have to do. Take the bus. Go up there. As a matter of fact, I've told them I'd help them pay to get up there. And so then when I find out that, and, and by the way, a lot of the drugs that, we're talk, that they're talking about, you know, they look at the labels and they say, they see that uh, these, these drugs are the identical drugs, of course, and packaged, same places that, that, uh, here in the United States. And so they get very, very confused, I think, as Mr. Goodneck said. They get confused. They don't know. They don't understand it. They don't get it. And so I just, uh, I would just ask that uh, you all look into that. Have you all looked into doing any of the things that Mr. Sanders just suggested? Mr. Cummings, we've spent countless hours trying to examine processes or procedures that can allow these drugs in safely. And we've simply given our honest appraisal that the ideas that we have come up with and that others come up with can ameliorate the situation but cannot assure the safety. It will weaken the safety net that's been created. And if Congress wishes to do that because of price controls, that is an issue for the Congress. FDA has not found a magic answer to identify the safe drugs over here and the skept skeptical drugs over here. Well, it would be, it would be, I think you need to keep trying. Mr. Be Cummins, would you yield on that point? Yes, I'll yield. I'll give you some more time if you need it. Last week it was suggested that domestic Internet pharmacy sites get a seal of approval to validate that they're legitimate. Now, you say you haven't thought of anything to, to get the job done. Why not do the same thing with Canadian pharmacies in concert with the Canadian government? In other words, go to these various pharmacies up there and the ones here and, and, and validate whether or not, check them out, make sure they're legitimate. You've got a lot of people working for you. They could do that. Once they check out the Canadian as well as the American pharmacies, then there should be no problem. But to say you can't find an answer, just it begs the issue. I mean, the, the people here want to be getting these drugs at a fair price. And it's your responsibility to make sure that they get them at a fair price, as well as make sure they're pure. And, and that can be done through the packaging. I talked about that just a minute ago, where they're sealed so that they come back and you know that they haven't been broken. Or through making sure that the, the, the Internet sites are legitimate by working with the Canadian government to have them say, have them license them. Is this a legitimate one? Is it one we can work with? And do this. you're talking about doing it here, why not there as well? There's not as many of them up there as there are here. The reason you don't want to do it, it appears, is because the pharmaceutical companies aren't going to make as much money and because they give so much money here on the Hill. 
Uh, Mr. Cummins, I'll yield back if you have any additional questions. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask him to a answer that. Can we do that? Can you do what the chairman just asked? Well, we certainly at the hearing last week did say that we thought the ver verified Internet pharmacy site was a good idea and gave consumers a way of identifying legitimate sites from illegitimate. The question of doing that for, for foreign sites raises some, some other issues we'd be happy to look at. Mr. Taylor, would you like to add to that? Well, um, the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, who sponsor the, the VIPS program here in the United States, I believe have a Canadian version, but, but they do not provide a seal of approval for Canadian sites that sell their products in the United States because it violates state law. So they have a program that's a domestic Canada program and a domestic United States program, but they don't have a program that, that allows consumers in the United States to look at the seal and know that these products are FDA approved and 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 manufactured in accordance with with FDA standards. If the gentleman would yield, yes. The, if you can do it here, and there's limitations by state law or something, you're the you're the agency for the whole country. I mean, why in the world can't you send an emissary up to Canada to talk to their agencies and work out a an agreement? We passed NAFTA. We passed NAFTA so we could trade everything with Mexico and Canada. And you're telling me that you can't go to Canada, have somebody from your agency say, okay, we want to make sure in a, in a way to accredit these pharmacies to make sure that they're doing the job right, just like we're going to do it in the United States. That way the drugs can come in and they'll be safe because you'll know that pharmacy's on the level. I mean, to say, to say that you can't do it or imply it by what you just said really bothers all of us. I'm can sorry, Mr. Cummins. Uh, go ahead. No, just, Mr. Chairman, I, I mean, I just... I think that what disturbs me so much, first of all, I'm very pleased that this is a bipartisan effort. As you can see, we, we're um, on both sides of the aisle, we're very concerned about this. And I remember years ago, they, there used to be something in the boxing world called a rope-a-dope. And, <laughs> and the boxer just laid against the ropes and took the punches like you are, you probably feel like you're taking punches today. And then when the fight was over, they just walked out of the ring and maybe they won or maybe they felt that they lost. But let me tell you something. I hope you're not roper doping today because I've got too many constituents that are dying. And you cannot convince me for one second that you cannot do the kinds of things that the chairman is talking about. In some kind of way, I tell my staff so often there's so many people that, that their main power is the power to say no. Everything is no, no, we can't do it. They find every excuse not to do it. And I'm begging you, I'm not asking you, I'm begging you because I'm begging for people who want to simply live to find a way to do it. And Mr. Chairman, I would hope that we would try to maybe give these wonderful gentlemen some kind of timetable to come back to us with regard to uh, way to, if, if there are issues with this, showing us what the issues are and how uh, we might be able to resolve those issues as a Congress. That's why we're here. And with that, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cummins. We'll uh, we'll make the, we'll honor your request, uh, Mr. Gutnick. Did you have any other questions? Well, Mr. Chairman, I I want to I want to again thank you for this hearing, and, and I want to thank them for coming and testifying. The problem here, it seems to me, is much more about attitude. The FDA has taken the attitude that imported drugs are by themselves uh, illegal, and uh, as in in fact, this is a relatively solvable problem. Uh, technologically, the technology exists, it's off the shelf, it's inexpensive, and it's called counterfeit proof blister packs. They're available from most European countries. The FDA could require them in the United States, and it seems to me that if they really wanted to help us solve this problem, we could have this problem solved in 45 days. And it seems to me, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Cummins, I mean, it, it really is shameful that the FDA has taken the attitude that senior citizens who are simply trying to save a few bucks, and in many cases, a lot of bucks, and more importantly, to save and preserve their lives, are treated as common criminals by their own government. That is shameful. And it seems to me that the FDA has a responsibility, Secretary Thompson has a responsibility, to do what it can to allow seniors, to allow American consumers to do this in a safe way. As they said earlier in their testimony, they don't test American drugs. They assume that the drugs that you buy at the local drug stores are actually those drugs and they are not counterfeits. But the fact is that it's happening more and more where the local pharmacists are dealing in counterfeit drugs. They don't test them. They assume that they're safe and, and effective. 
we should at least assume that American consumers and most pharmacists, particularly in Canada and in the G7 countries, are not trying to kill their own patients. And there's no evidence that they're, they're dying like cordwood. Uh, and, you know, it really is shameful that the FDA is not working with us and with consumers and with the producers to come up with a, with a very simple, technologically effective way to guarantee to the maximum extent possible that these are, in fact, safe and effective drugs for American consumers. Any other comments, Mr. Sanders? Let me just very briefly uh, indicate my agreement with, with all of the comments made by my colleagues and just make this point. Given the fact that we live in a global economy, given the fact that the lettuce and the tomatoes that we ate for lunch today came from God knows where, what kind of farm in Mexico, the grapes that I get from Chile, I don't know where they come from. I don't know what they have been sprayed on. And yet, all of those products are imported into this country. Mr. Goodkin gave some of those statistics. If the federal government and the FDA can say it is okay for us to consume those problems, how in God's name are you not able to regulate a few dozen pharmacies in an advanced country like Canada, which already has a regulatory system as strong as ours? That begs any rational explanation. You can do it. Of course you can do it. And if the chairman told you to come back in a month with a mechanism to do it, you could do it if you wanted to do it. And our frustration is we know you can do it if you wanted to do it, but for some reason, and some of us have our suspicion that it has to do with the awesome, awesome amount of money that comes into government from the pharmaceutical industry, you choose not to do that. So I would hope that you will come back to this committee and tell us how you can perform the relatively, relatively easy task of regulating and make sure that the products that come from an advanced country like Canada, which already has a strong regulatory system, are safe for the American consumers. Yeah. We believe they are safe. We believe you can do that. Uh, let me end up by saying, because I know you're tired, you've been here a long time, that uh, uh, you could do this one country at a time and you could start with Canada. Uh, and if you did that and it showed that uh, it was going to be effective, then you could look at other countries that uh, one at a time. It does, it's not something that has to be done all at once. But I think uh, we want to make sure that Americans uh, get the best price. And I, I'm very concerned that we're going to pass a prescription drug benefit. And if you guys don't do something like this over there, that the government is going to be incurring these huge differentials in, in the price between here in the United States and around the world. And the last thing I'd like to say is there are 600, I want to say this to my colleagues, there are at least 600 lobbyists here in Washington that are paid by the pharmaceutical companies. And the $20 million that comes in every two years to members of Congress and the, and the, and, and the, and the White House, whoever's in the White House at the time, that $20 million and those 600 lobbyists aren't going to go away. And we're going to have a fight on our hands. And the 600 lobbyists, you can better be paid a heck of a lot more than the $20 million. So this is something that we're going to have to fight at a grassroots level. And that's why we contacted the AARP, and they've already written an article. And we're going to contact every senior citizens uh, group. And in your own districts, and if you're talking to our colleagues, if you could talk to them about contacting their people, their senior citizens groups, and, and, and have there be a barrage of correspondence coming into Congress saying, hey, let's get this job done. Then I think the heat will get so great that we'll be able to get it done, even in spite of all that money. And with that, Mr. Hubbard and Mr. Taylor, thank you for being here. Thank you for having Appreciate us, Mr. Chairman. We'd like to call now. Elizabeth Wenner. Uh, she's an MPHDHA, President and CEO of United Health Alliance, uh, Principal Health Innova. Mr. Andy Trozak, Troz, Trozak, Trozak, Vice President of Standards of Canadian International Pharmacists Association. Mr. Robert M. Hayes. Is anybody staying here from the FDA? Is anybody staying here from the FDA? I'll stay. Are you with the FDA? I am. I would like for you to stay and hear their testimony and maybe convey that back to, to Mr. Tom. I'm not alone. I've got, we have other staff here too. Good, good. Well, we appreciate that very much. Uh, Mr. Robert Hayes, a Medicare Rights Center, and Mr. J.P. Garnier, Garnier or Garner? Is it Garnier? Garnier, Chief Executive Officer of Gla oh, GlaxoSmithKline. I know he's not going to be here, but uh, 
we'll uh, have some questions that we'll <coughs> send to him. Would you please rise so I can uh, have you sworn in? You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, help you God? I do. I Be do. seated. We'll stop with you, start with you, Dr. Winner. First, um, can you pull the mic to you, please? Let's see here. We're going to get the water out of the way here. First, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this very important hearing. I have submitted written testimony, but what I'm going to do is just attempt to synopsize what I have provided to you with your permission. Um, you know, uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about where I come from so that the, the uh, panel can understand uh, why we started this. Um, as you mentioned, I have s a couple of different things that I'm involved with. I, you mentioned my name earlier in terms of some of the labeling that we've been working on, and I'll mention that a little bit later. Um, we first got involved as a provider network um, in a rural community because we were very concerned about compliance. And if you understand uh, quality, we really, that is a pure definition in a provider's mind. Uh, compliance is really the ability for the patient to be able to take their medications as prescribed so that you can get the outcome, the intended outcome. Now, technology in the form of a pill is here to stay. It's a major component of health care. So as, as a provider, you're looking at this and, and you make an assumption. Some, sometimes it's a false assumption, but you make the assumption that if you prescribe it for your patient, that they are going to take it as prescribed. Now, when you find out that they cannot access it and its affordability, you have an ethical dilemma. You know, you prescribe something, it exists, and they can't afford to take it. So from our perspective, about three years ago, we got very actively involved, and uh, we do have to thank, uh, we have much gratitude uh, and appreciation to uh, Congressman Sanders for um, starting the initiative up in Vermont. We just basically uh, piggybacked onto what he started and decided that if it could be done, we had so many individuals we were trying to serve that could not get on a bus, could not, you know, they just couldn't leave their home. They needed to have access. We decided that it, it it needed to be brought in through the mail and that we were going to be willing to attempt it. Our first case was with an individual who um, had breast cancer and needed tamoxifen. And so we tried to come up with something very simple that would facilitate the process. And um, in, in doing so, we um, suddenly became bombarded because we were initially concerned with just our local community. Um, since that time, we now are serving individuals in every state in the United States. We did the survey and counted that there were over um, 1.2 million individuals using this mechanism to access safe, affordable prescription drugs. Now, having said that, um, what I'd like to do is just sort of summarize what I'd like to talk to you about today, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Um, the, the issues are, are very large from the perspective of, if you look at it globally, um, we all know that, uh, as has been previously mentioned here, uh, in employers are having a hard time trying to manage this problem. States are having a hard time trying to manage this problem. And certainly the federal government is having a hard time trying to manage this problem. We have a major crisis on our hands. And so for those of us that are out there trying to deal with it every day, I think that um, we're constantly trying to be creative and innovative. And I would say to you that if, um, if the FDA can't figure out how to do this in terms of some of the things you mentioned, we have offered before in previous testimony that we would be more than happy in the private sector to take on some of the burden of doing this. This should not be your burden alone to do. And we are willing to step up to the plate. And I challenge physicians, I challenge pharmacists, it is part of their responsibility to do this. And that's the reason our physicians have gotten involved. They must be engaged in these conversations. You cannot solve this problem alone. They must be there helping you. And so I, I tell you, we will wholeheartedly help you solve this problem. Having said that, I'd like to talk to you about some of the, um, the problems that uh, exist right now in terms of the mechanism we've been using very effectively for over three years now to facilitate the process. I think I've heard some discussions about uh, the legality of personal reimportation. And, and let me be real clear. Personal reimportation is the area that we have been focused on, trying to help one individual at a time. Having said that, we do know that there are employer groups now that are very concerned and considering this. I have a gentleman here with me today who is the president and CEO of Aubuchon Hardware. He's a self-funded um, employer, and he has been considering this effort. We did an analysis. He is currently using a PBM in the U.S. With accessing medications from Canada, he could save another 25% another 
over what he's saving here. He feels he has an obligation to his employees under self-funded to help them maintain their benefits. We agree. But he has now um, sort of been held at it's a stalemate now because of the recent FDA letters that have been issued in terms of things. So he is now on a, hold, a holding pattern in terms of doing this. Um, we, I think our major concern now is uh, the recent activity with uh, the pharmaceutical industry cutting supply. Now, I'd like to get back to the compliance uh, issue that I, I spoke to you about. If you know you have individuals that are complying with the treatment plan and having good outcomes, now do you call it good quality to cut that supply to those individuals that have been complying? I think not. By the very definition of quality, they are complying and we have good outcomes. So to cut the supply after three years of knowledge of this taking place borders on I have to tell you, it, it's just intolerable from my perspective to think that that would occur with an entity that professes to be part of a provider network, major technology they provide to save peace, people's lives, and now they're going to take it away from them. I, I, I think it's unethical. I don't, I don't want to talk about legal. I want to talk about ethics, and it's a major ethical dilemma for us. Now, we have worked very hard to try and think about how we could help solve the pro some of the problems that have been discussed around safety and quality. And if you put the right people in a room and sit and talk about it, you can come up with some very creative things. You mentioned IMPAC. IMPAC is Internet and Mail Order Pharmacy Accreditation Commission that has been licensed to a professional association made up of pharmacists and physicians from Canada, the U.S. and Mexico that has just recently been put together. In fact, they've just recently had their first board meeting. Those individuals are looking broader than just reimportation. That, that's not their major mission. Their major mission is to look at things in pharmacoeconomics and pharmotherapeutics that they might be able to do that will help us all across the country, the whole North American continent, to cross collaborate, not only with two sets of professionals that have never been in a, one single association, but across three countries that we could really use our resources much better. IMPAC is an accreditation process that is much like the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that all of our hospitals are required to be accredited before they're reimbursed for care. Physicians are held to a set of standards as, as well. Prescription drugs are really the only one component and particularly in the form of mail order. And now when you talk about internet pharmacies, I'd like a clarification here, please. Internet is mail order, first and foremost. We have mail order in this com country, and I would, I would challenge people to please tell me in mail order, do you believe that when something comes from across the country to you in a package, do you have every assurance that that is completely safe? I have yet to see them meeting a set of standards and meeting these accreditation standards that we require every other component in healthcare to do. I think it's time. The time is now. Now, having said that, we believe that Canadian pharmacies are willing to step up to the plate to meet these accreditation standards. Once they meet those standards, they would then be issued these non-counterfeitable seals, which um, I'm going to ask you if you happen to have a $20 bill in your pocket um, to pull it out and look at it because it's the same technology that's utilized by our U.S. Mint. It is not counterfeitable. And I'm going to show you how it, it's optical technology, and I do also have an expert here with me that can answer technical questions. But if you pull it out, thank you, Mr. Gutnick. If you look at the um, right-hand corner, the 20 there, you will notice that it is a different color. If you hold it flat under the light and rotate it, you will see that it optically changes. I could, if you just rotate it towards you, and you will see it change in color. That, ca that cannot be broken, that optical code. The FBI has not been able to break that code. And I would ask you one question. If it's good enough for our currency, is it good enough to be used here? I would profess that it is. We have come up with a prototype label. In front of me, I actually have something that's much broader that I would suggest you think about. And that is, is that anything that leaves an FDA manufacturing approved site Every manufacturer should have this labeling on their bottle. That's a good beginning in terms of stopping counterfeiting right there and, in, and endorsing safety. It, but I'm going to say it again. If it's good enough for the U.S. Mint, it should be good enough for our prescription drugs. Um, with that, I would tell you that, uh, the, again, I'll just final, I finalize my comments by saying three things. One, the interpretation of whether this is legal or not is where we're having a problem. 
The manufacturer's recent efforts in Canada to shut supply is our second issue. And third is the FDA's recent letters that they have been sending out in terms of threatening those of us that attempt to help our patients. Um, those are barriers to success in Canada. And the last thing I will say is, is that Canada is not a third world country. We do site visits to all the pharmacies that, uh, that we utilize. And I don't understand if we can do it in the private sector, why is it that they can't do it at the FDA? Of course, leave it to the private sector then. We will engage them in the conversation. We will make sure they have a list of every registered pharmacy in, in Canada or any place else in the world. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I, I think that you've probably heard us and our suspicions of why. <laughs> so take that for what it's worth. There's an awful lot of pressure being exerted up here. Mr. Trozak. Is that right, Trozak? Uh, close enough. Oh, I want to make sure I get this right. We from Canada have uh, strange names and uh, from different planets. Yeah. <laughs> you guys play a lot of hockey up there, too, don't you? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members, uh, thank you for having the opportunity to um, discuss uh, safety issues uh, from Canada. I am a Canadian uh, licensed pharmacist, and when I graduated, I pledged an oath to take the health, safety, and well-being of my patients as a priority. I've had the privilege of working in community pharmacy for eight years and also in academia. And I've had the ability to work with patients, and every time I did, I took that to the, um, the strongest possible level. I think patient safety and overall patient health should be, be the priority of any pharmacist working in any kind of realm, be it hospital, retail, or innovative delivery of service such as distance-based delivery or mail order. Canadian pharmacy is recognized internationally as a leader in innovation, focus, and patient health and safety. Pharmacy is a highly regulated, regulated profession in Canada, and pharmacists must adhere to guidelines administered by the federal and provincial regulatory organizations. Health Canada has a branch called the Health Protection Branch that is responsible for approving and regulating medications in Canada. The Health Protection Branch has a similar role to the FDA in the United States. And that's what kind of surprised me when Mr. Hubbard was talking about uh, not understanding the Canadian approval systems because to my knowledge the FDA and the Health Protection Branch work hand in hand and know equally what one does. Medications are approved would, would, would and sold. You would you repeat that one more time? I want to make sure that we got that. To my understanding the Health Protection Branch which is the equivalent uh, branch in our government to the FDA um, to my knowledge works hand in hand uh, in communicating between the border on issues of drug regulations. And I'm not an expert in this area. Uh, I would ask that you maybe subpoena someone from um, the Canadian government that is, because I know that these two organizations do talk together. Uh, the process of approving drugs in Canada, Canada is similar to that of the United States. In part, this process is facilitated by a high degree of collaboration between the Health Protection Branch and FDA as well by the fact that a vast majority of prescription pharmaceuticals are manufactured in the United States and are bioequivalent or identical in both countries. Now the distribution of medications from drug manufacturers to pharmacies is also very highly controlled. Pharmacies can only purchase medications directly from a drug manufacturer or through a wholesaler that is licensed by Health Canada to sell pharmaceuticals. Only pharmacies licensed by the provincial regulatory authorities can purchase prescription medications that are to be dispensed to the public. There are approximately 12 wholesalers in Canada, and their ability to control and regulate them is quite easy. In Canada, provincial pharmacy regulatory organizations called colleges or associations regulate the practice of pharmacy. A pharmacy must obtain a license from the provincial pharmacy regulatory organization to be able to dispense prescription medications to the public. Each province and territory has a legislative pharmacy act in addition to standards of practice and a code of ethics uh, that pharmacies and pharmacists must abide by. I am vice president of an organization called the Canadian International Pharmacy Association. I handle standards. We were created in November of 2002 and our main focus was to represent Canadian pharmacies practicing international pharmacy but also to put forth standards and regulation into this industry. So we are willing to work closely with the FDA, with U.S. regulators, 
to make this a safe and viable practice. We currently have what is known as a CIPA certification process. Uh, as was mentioned by the FDA, we tried to become VIPS certified, but we were denied VIPS certification because we could not get a license to practice pharmacy in, in each of the states. But our members were willing to take that process, but were denied. Um, so what we did is we mirrored our CIPA certification behind the VIPS certification. Now Dr. Wenner has mentioned that there is another certification program. I guess what I'd like to tell this committee is that uh, regulated licensed professional pharmacies are willing to work with any U.S. organization that will enhance the safety um, and the well-being of U.S. patients. Thank you. Is, is all of your comments in, uh, in your written statement? Yes, I have submitted okay. a, a I, I formal statement. I want to send statement. that to the FDA mm -hmm. because I think that's important. Send that to the head of the FDA and to Senator or to uh, uh, Thompson, Mr. Thompson. Uh, Mr. Hayes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Um, the Medicare Rights Center is the largest independent source of Medicare information and assistance in, in the United States. Um, day in and day out, uh, what we do is we work with people with Medicare to assist them access needed health care. Tens of thousands of callers use our helplines annually, and no surprise to you members of this committee, the greatest and gravest unmet need of older and disabled Americans is the unavailability of affordable prescription medicine. From the trenches from which we work in, Mr. Chairman, the unaffordability of prescription medicine is the national emergency you folks at least seem to recognize. Today, the importation of comparatively affordable medicine from Canada is literally saving the lives of people we work with. Of course, I think we all here know that easing access to lower-priced prescription drugs imported from Canada is not the comprehensive, ultimately the intelligent response this national emergency requires. But keeping this lifeline open is essential to the health security of hundreds of thousands of American citizens. We, we at the Medicare Rights Center, our staff, we rely heavily on volunteers are routinely in the heartbreaking position of being unable to assist callers help uh, find the affordable medicine they do need. We do everything we can to advise consumers. We research state prescription programs. We look at veterans benefits, supplemental insurance programs, discount cards, free samples, private company programs, family foundations, mail order houses, internet pharmacies, yes, even those that are not in the United States, and maybe we're lucky the FDA has taken off. We go to the kindness of strangers frequently to try to get medicine for people who need it, but too often we fail. And I think this committee really finds itself today legislatively in the same situation our volunteer counselors work in. We, like you, considering this legislation to bring for cheaper drugs from, from Canada, are doing what we can do with what we have, knowing what we have to work with is, is terribly inadequate. Mr. Chairman, three quick points. One, Congress should amend the Prescription Drug Marketing Act to authorize individuals to import from Canada, whether by mail, by internet, by visit, prescription drugs for personal use. It seems pretty clear it's vitally in the nation's interest to take the discretion away from the FDA on how they enforce existing law. Two, more significantly, Congress, again, needs to take the lead in authorizing clearly uh, authority to uh, re-import prescription drugs from Canada. And three, I got to say that those of us who uh, try to keep somewhat away from politics and are working with folks in the trenches um, are so gratified to see a committee work as this committee is doing. I think folks on both sides of the aisle here, maybe three aisles almost, um, should be hugging each other because it's such an unusual sight uh, from the trenches to see this kind of uh, tripartisan commitment to the public good. But there should be applause for the introduction of H.R. 847. From our daily work, assisting people find affordable, affordable drugs. We know that many Americans are going without will go without medicine if their Canadian pharmacy is cut off and they cannot find alternatives. Our experience, contrary to what um, I expected our friends from Glaxo to say, but what they do say on their website, our experience is that older Americans will not find an affordable alternative if the Canadian pharmacy route is cut off from them. 
And again, our experience, contrary to what GlaxoSmithKline speculates on, is that our callers, consumers, have not faced dangers in purchasing drugs from Canada. The danger, as you folks have made quite clear, the danger they face is going without the medicines that doctors have prescribed. So to wrap up, four things we know. One, there is direct evidence that citizens of this nation, real people, someone's parents, grandparents, and wives are going without the medication they need. We're not speculating on that evidence. Two, more Americans will be able to afford more medicines that the doctors have prescribed if they are allowed to purchase the drugs re-imported from Canada. Three, there is absolutely no evidence of any person suffering negative effects or complications because the medicine was re-imported from Canada. And fourth, ask any physician in America who treats an elderly population. The damage to our citizens who go without needed medication is palpable, painful, it's frequently deadly. So Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uh, committee members from all parties here, we thank you for your efforts to mitigate the damage being done to our people. Let me just ask a couple of questions, uh, uh, and I won't take my full five minutes, which is unusual. Uh, Mr. Hayes, you deal with the, the realities of life when you deal with these people. Are there people dying as a result of the problems that they can't afford prescription drugs? No question, Mr. Chairman. You, you wouldn't have any idea from your experience what the number might be? No idea. Uh, obviously, we can only uh, help so many people with our small crew of uh, uh, horribly paid staff and volunteers, many of them elderly themselves, many of them who become volunteers in, this, in these trenches because they've experienced the same hardship. Um, I think Congressman Sanders' idea to get the GAO to do some examination of this is vitally important and would be very useful. Well, I think many of us will join him in asking for that study. Uh, how, many, how big an area do you deal with? Uh, nationwide. Nationwide. And so you have volunteers all across the country who feel as you do. Um, we have callers around the country. We callers. have call answers uh, based mostly in New York. Um, but it, 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 this, this is a problem that is mitigated to some extent in some states where there is a state prescription drug program that helps some people. I know, but uh, in many states they don't have that. Many they don't. And, and so as a result, people are suffering. Yeah, yeah. And well, of course, you'll hear from Glaxo and from any other drug company about all the alternatives there are. Believe me, we use them. We have no ideology against any pharmaceutical company. But it's, it's similar to running from soup kitchen to soup kitchen to get a meal. It's so hard to access, and more often than not, we can't help people find anything. Uh, Ms. Winner, or Dr. Winner, uh, I, I just want you to answer one question. It is possible to use this kind of technology to make sure that the drugs being imported from Canada or any place, as long as you've got a cooperating pharmacy, uh, to make sure that they're absolutely safe. Absolutely. And I mean, and on top of that, you've put an additional layer by requiring that they meet a set of standards themselves, mm -hmm. which includes a site visit. And then there's a list of standards with multiple elements under it um, that I'd be more than happy to provide you with that whole listing. Well, and what I would those. like from you and any, all of you and, and to give us a list of things that you think could be done to make sure the importation of pharmaceuticals are safe. You give us a list of those and we'll give it to the FDA and we'll ask them to check that out because they say they can't find an answer. And we believe that maybe you do have some answers. And if, uh, if they look at your, your answers and say that they're not workable, we're going to ask them why. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do our very best to work with you and we'd like to continue to have this kind of dialogue. Uh, Ms. Watson, do you have any questions? Uh, not really a question, but um, the models that have been mentioned here, I would hope that we could maybe, well, I guess this piece of legislation does that. I, I would like to ask the uh, authors of H.R. Uh, 847, and I haven't really looked at every line, but uh, do you authorize the access and the labeling and the licensing through this legislation? Uh, there are two separate issues. 847 deals specifically, uh, is a response to what Glaxo did. 
And what we say is that drug companies, not just Glaxo, cannot discriminate against Americans and limit supplies to Canada. And if they do that, they're going to be fined heavily. But to answer your question, in other reimportation uh, language uh, bills that we have introduced, the issues that you have raised are dealt with. Among many other things, we have built, I'll give it back to you, but we have built in a very strong regulatory mechanism to make sure that all product that comes into this country is FDA approved and is safe. Is that in addition to this bill? You yes. said other bills? Yes. Okay. I would like the panel uh, to respond if the bills that have already been introduced meet your needs of making these drugs accessible across the border. Well, I think there's a litany of bills that are out there that are trying to serve multiple purposes. I mean, obviously, in the ideal world, we'd love to see one comprehensive bill that could serve multiple purposes. Um, the reality, I'm going to get back, and maybe I'm going to sound like the FDA here, but safety um, is a major concern of ours, and quality is a concern. Let's not confuse counterfeiting, although it's a component of this. Counterfeiting, as Mr. Gutnick eloquently pointed out, exists in every country in the world, including the United States. Um, it, we are not attempting to solve all of the potential counterfeiting problems. What we are trying to do is assure the highest level of safety that we can and quality as it relates to something that is being brought back in. And again, we are just talking about Canada, but it could the same technology can be applied. And certainly this technology we are talking about right here in terms of the seals that would go around the bottle or on a labeling is saying that once it left the manufacturing site in this condition and this optical technology is so inexpensive expensive in terms of how you assess it by simply rotating it, and it is very easy to do. It doesn't require huge resources. This is a first stage effort of saying that you have done something at that manufacturing level when it leaves there. That is the first step. The second thing is, is that we are talking about the pharmacies actually meeting a set of accreditation standards just like hospitals in the United States are required to do now. I will point it out again, every component of health care, with the exception of this one, is required to meet some set of accreditation Would you standards. For a minute. Yes. Are, are the bills that are out there doing what you're asking, then let's have a bill introduced. I, I have not seen specific language that would require any mail something. order pharmacy to meet a set of the standards. The gentlelady will yield. Uh, last year, uh, we introduced a, a bill uh, which for, in a sense, political and practical considerations, limited the reimportation from Canada, which had built in it very, very strong uh, re regulatory and safety safeguards. Mm -hmm. This year, that bill has already been introduced in the Senate and will be introduced in the House. Yes, uh, uh, would Mr. You, Chair, if I may, yes, on sir. this issue, mm -hmm. when that bill comes over here, uh, to the House of Reps, why not amend it to put in the provisions that you're describing if they're not already Good. enumerated? We can do that. We can prepare them and have them ready to amend into the bill. Then it could go into conference. And, and what we'll this come does do is, it very simply, it makes the FDA, I should say, customs job okay. much easier because now, if they, I believe that one of the envelopes is floating around, in addition to it being secured this way, on the, on the cover of that shipping and handling package, there's a non-counterfeitable non seal that would be applied that's simply rotated by the customs officer. And if the seal doesn't change optically in terms of the color, it should go, it should be not allowed into the United States. Very simply. I, I am working on, on that portion of the bill because I think that is a critical point. But if I could just make this point, Mr. Chairman, just real briefly. The problem we have confronted for the last four years is that we have come up with a number of ideas, but what we are dealing with here is an agency who clearly does not want to do this. And, and no matter what we may put in statute, if, if they don't want to do it, and in fact, it is on the books today uh, that they have to allow personal importation, and yet, they are finding every excuse possible not to enforce the law that is on the book. In fact, in my opinion, to uh, misinterpret the law that is on the book. So whatever we put in law will be very difficult to get the FDA to uh, implement if they are not willing to at least listen to what we and uh, the vast majority of Americans are saying. You, it is your time. I am sorry. Why is it that along with the amendments that you have already been working on that we could not uh, put in a provision? 
uh, directing the FDA to do this, and if it's not done by a certain date, there are consequences, whatever that might be. Well, I, I think that's an excellent idea. As a matter of fact, we may have to put at the end of this bill this year, assuming we can get it to a floor vote on the House and in the Senate, we may have to put a line at the very end that says, and we really mean it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work with you on that. Well, I, I suppose you could put a criminal penalty in there. If yeah. they don't, if they don't uh, comply with the law, then uh, the bureaucrats are, are liable. Uh, Can I just make a comment regarding the, the Canadian political system as uh, reacting to the current laws? Um, in February, uh, our organization took uh, Glaxel to the Competition Bureau, the Federal Competition Bureau. Uh, because Glaxel has, and just, just to be on the record, Glaxel has imposed the ban to Canadian pharmacies that sell uh, prescription medications to U.S. Uh, patients. So that ban is on as of January 21st. We took the uh, Glaxel to the Competition Bureau. The Competition Bureau came back and said, you have a case in every single circumstance with the exception of the legality. And the Competition Bureau dropped the case because they talked to the FDA and were told that this is an illegal act. So I think it also has to be understood the FDA that... The FDA told them it was an illegal act. Yes, they did. <sighs> the law doesn't say that. Yep. Judge, did you have any questions? Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm, uh, I had some other meetings, and so I'm, uh, I don't have many questions. But I will say that I, uh, we had a hearing that got into some of these things uh, before the Government Reform Committee just a few days ago. Mr. Hubbard testified, and they had a... Uh, an official from the, the Federal Trade Commission who testified, and he he said in response to a question that I asked uh, that they ha had not received any complaints, not one, at the Federal Trade Commission from uh, uh, people who had uh, gotten uh, prescription drugs over the Internet. And uh, uh, what, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you you can get a little more with a carrot than with a stick, and I... I actually introduced a bill that I knew wouldn't really go any place, but I thought, well, we'll start the conversation at least maybe to uh, try to come up with some type of tax break for a pharmaceutical company that would certify that they were selling their drugs at the same price in this country as in any other country. <laughs> and uh, uh, what, uh, what I think, though, that the chairman a while ago uh, got into the area where probably something really could be done on this and that is uh, we put some provision in the uh, uh, in the law uh, w when we set up the prescription drug plan that uh, that no company can participate unless they will certify that they're selling those drugs to the government for the prescription drug plan at the same at the lowest price that they're selling at any place else something to that effect but I appreciate your uh, testimony today and I've, I've read over as much as I could here in, the, in just a few minutes and I'm sorry I didn't get to hear it all in person. Thank you Mr. Chairman. That's a great idea and uh, we'll see if we can't get an amendment to that effect uh, on the that. floor with a bunch of us speaking on it. Right. Mr. Sanders? I'll be brief because we have some votes. I, I just want to thank our panelists that without exception the testimony w was excellent. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hayes told us that in the real world people are suffering and dying because they can't afford prescription drugs. Uh, Dr. Trozek, and we thank you very much for coming south, has told us about the high standards of the Canadian pharmaceutical industry and their willingness and desire to cooperate with the United States government in making sure all of the safety standards that we require are met. And Dr. Wenner, who comes from Bennington, Vermont, you forgot to mention that, Beth, has done just a, an outstanding job uh, starting off a small scale in Bennington and spreading all over this country. And because of Dr. Winner's work, God knows how many Americans now are receiving medicine that they, that they require at, at reasonable prices. And we thank you all very much. And, and her innovative ideas in terms of safety are great. The answer, the conclusion that I reach, Mr. Chairman, I think you said it and, and uh, Mr. Goodconnect has said it, we've all said it. This is a problem that can be easily solved if there is the will to solve it. And we have got to continue to work together because, as Mr. Hayes has indicated, the stakes are enormous. People are dying today and they are suffering because this institution, our Congress, has not acted. 
and I pledge to work with all. Let's all work together in a nonpartisan way, and if we do, we will succeed. Very good, very good, Mr. Goodnick. Well, Mr. Chairman, we do have a vote, and I, I do want to thank uh, the witnesses. Uh, this was excellent testimony. I wish we had time, especially for Dr. Winter. Uh, she has testified before. We have met several times. Uh, the program that they have going on is really the model that I would like to see implemented around the, the country uh, and I think can be expanded upon. Um, this is one of the most frustrating issues that, that I have uh, ever been involved with and I always tell people uh, I feel sometimes like the little boy who came in and asked his mother a question and his mother was busy and she said go ask your dad and the little boy said well I didn't want to know that much about it. The more you learn about what is happening and the pernicious nature of the way pharmaceutical drugs are priced around the world, the, the, it, it is really shameful. And it seems to me that uh, working together with people in the private sector, uh, that there has to be a better way to come up with a, a, a formula so that at least we can have average prices. Mm -hmm. You know, there is no excuse for the world's largest market paying the world's highest prices. Right. And, and if I could just say also, we subsidize this industry in three separate ways. Mr. Sanders mentioned through the tax code. We are incredibly generous in terms of allowing them to write off their expenses. Secondly, we subsidize them uh, in the amount that we spend on basic research. This year, this federal government will spend over 21 billion taxpayer dollars on basic research, much of which will go to benefit the pharmaceutical industry. And then finally, we pay, as American consumers, virtually all of the costs for the other research that's done, and that's being used by consumers all around the rest of the world. I want to I thank our excellent uh, panels. I want to thank you for having this hearing. This is a very important first step. It is a bipartisan issue. It's, a, it's an issue whose time has come, and ultimately I am confident that uh, sometime during this Congress we are going to move this ball forward and uh, allow Americans to have access to world-class drugs at world market prices. Well, let, let me just make a suggestion. Individual bills may or may not succeed, but we are going to have a prescription drug bill on the floor for discussion and debate. We need to go to the Rules Committee, ask for an open rule so we can amend that, and then try to put something in there that will deal with this problem so people can get the lowest prices on these drugs. So that, that's going to be the opening that we can get to if we really work at it. And with that, thank you for being here, and we'd like to have all your suggestions so we can write to the FDA. We stand, we stand adjourned. America and the Courts this week will feature the oral arguments from this past week's Supreme Court cases dealing with race-based admission policies at the University of Michigan. We'll play both hours of the oral arguments for you starting this evening at 6.30 Eastern on our companion network, C-SPAN.